Welcome back, everybody. Uh, this lecture order is a little bit out of order. Um, and briefly, wanted to talk about this this voodoo correlations paper that came out a while ago, maybe ten years ago. Um, it's related to both the ROI analysis that we did and also related to what we're going to be doing with MVPA analysis because this will tell you about what you should not do. It's very important because I don't want any of you to, you know, A, do things incorrectly and B, get caught by a reviewer doing it. So I'm going to start with um, the so-called biased or non-independent error analysis looking at some behavioral studies, and then we'll move to the neuroimaging part of it. Um, it's a lot easier to look at in a, a behavioral context. This has been out for a while. This is a paper by Feinstein back in uh, 1988. Critiquing epidemiological studies, which tend to look at many, many different variables that are correlated with something like heart disease, diabetes, cancer, things of that nature. Now, what we seem to find all the time is that, you know, something like uh, alcohol or coffee or eggplant, whatever, it seems to be linked to cancer. And, you know, according to Dave Barry, also lack of eggplant causes cancer, so there's really no way to win. Why this seems to be such a problem is, first of all, there's a huge sample size, and there are a lot of different variables in a lot of these studies. What tends to happen is people hypothesize after the fact, so they collect all the data, they run the correlations, and then they kind of pick which of those correlations were significant. So obviously you can account for this somewhat by correcting for multiple comparisons. We talked about that before with Bonferroni correction. In a behavioral uh, scenario, that's entirely appropriate and, and should be done. Just to give you another kind of bias analysis in a behavioral sense, and the, for some reason, it's more obvious why it's inappropriate here than it is in uh, imaging analysis. I'm going to use an example with something called Four Loco. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay, that really concerns me that so many people are laughing. Going, yeah. Okay, so for those of you, <laughs> for those of you who don't know what this is, this is basically designed to. Uh, destroy the lives of young people. Yes. <laughs> I never had it, so you know. I swear to God. But apparently, this is like a tall boy, and it contains the equivalent of is it six shots? Oh, wow. Last I checked, yeah. six shots and four cups of uh, coffee. Like all at once. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So it's not something that you just <laughs> sip. <laughs> okay. So it's, it's a crazy, crazy, crazy drink. But what if I worked for Four Loco and I said, I want to see if this has some kind of positive effect on the test scores of uh, Milwaukee undergraduates. Artists' representation. <laughs> they all look really young to me. And so I, I get a sample. I give them to Four Loco. And then they take some tests on math or whatever. And, you know, the people that didn't do so well, I go, I'm just going to ignore them and only focus on the people who had the effect that I wanted and I'm looking for. And so I only take them and then I, I you know, do some inferential analysis and I say, oh, well, there's a significant effect. Obviously, we know why that's not appropriate. I mean, the whole the, the thing that could possibly kill you aside, the ethical problems, it's a wrong analysis because we're only choosing the people who had the effect that we wanted. So that should be pretty clear why that's a problem. This is called a bias analysis, also a circular analysis, because you're defining the people and then running the analysis, non-independent, and if you want a verb, they also call this double dipping. So you take your whole sample, you delete the people that you know, don't meet your threshold, and then you run the statistics on the people who remain. Okay. Now, in imaging, again, using this uh, little graphic here, instead of having a, a small sample of undergraduates to run a test on, instead we have all these different boxes of the brain which we're doing uh, tests on. Now, in an extreme case, let's say your samples or your resolution is one by one by one, you could easily run up to, say, 500,000 voxels, or at least in the tens of thousands, no matter what kind of resolution. Even with smoothing and accounting for spatial correlations, you still would have tens of thousands of independent tests. 
Now, to account for that, we can hit, we can do multiple comparison correction. That's entirely uh, appropriate. But, oh, let me put my turn signal on. Um, okay, so fMRI analysis, we're not in the behavioral sphere anymore, but still the same principles apply. Now, why this came to attention about 10 years ago, we've got to go back to 2006, looking at a paper published by Grill, Specter, and colleagues where they were examining uh, responses to different uh, categories in the, the fusiform face area. So that's the front of the brain, that's the back, we're looking from the bottom up. But what they found was if you look only in the voxels responsive to faces and animals, cars and sculptures, say these all pass that threshold we were talking about yesterday, and I extract the data from just the face voxels, just the animal voxels, just the, the significant car voxels, significant uh, sculpture voxels, you only you will get this what seems to be a very clear pattern where there's selective activity for each of those conditions. Right? I know, right? <laughs> but here's the problem. Um, this came to the attention of a researcher named uh, Baker. I forget his first name, but he wrote a letter to the editor saying, well, you've already defined them to be significant, and then you extract the data. So that's not entirely uh, appropriate. And here's why. If I took a non-brain ROI, say something out here that had nothing brain-related in it, I did the same thing. I would get this same pattern. I would find some noisy voxels just by chance significant to each one of those, right? So obviously this can't be the case because we're taking this data from uh, non-brain voxels. Now, if I use a non-brain ROI but I use an unbiased analysis, which we'll get into shortly, you don't see a significant effect anywhere, which is exactly what we should find. Now, what happens if we apply this unbiased, it's called cross-validation, which we'll talk about in the MVPA lecture, this unbiased analysis to the original uh, grill spectra data. If we do that, you still get some effects, but that whole pattern that we found before tends to go away. So across all these different uh, voxels, if you do this cross-validation technique, which is unbiased, it seems as though face activity is significant pretty much across the board in this area, but you don't see this uh, category selective pattern that we did before. All right? So you do the bias analysis, obviously it doesn't make sense because you get an effect even if you look at non-brain voxels. You do the unbiased one and now the pattern looks different. So how are we going to distinguish between the two? Um, yeah, I, I will go into this because this is the, the, the crux of the matter. Back in 2009, I was just starting out as a lab manager, and this paper by Ed Wool and colleagues came out where they found that uh, the correlations that were being reported in social neuroscience studies were suspiciously high. So they, they surveyed a bunch of different researchers. They asked them what kind of analysis they did could they categorize it as a biased or an unbiased analysis? And what was their effect size from these ROIs they extracted from? This is an identical procedure to what we did, except instead of extracting uh, these parameter estimates, they were extracting correlation values, right? They would run some kind of covariate analysis and then get the correlation values. Now, uh, their estimate of what the upper bound, theoretically, of the correlation that you you could get, given things like the reliability of the fMRI data and the reliability of the covariates, their max estimate was 0.74. You shouldn't get anything higher than that. But lo and behold, if you mark where that is, there's quite a bit of these values that are above that. So isn't that curious? Now, if we shade in which of these seem to be non-independent or biased ROI analyses, the majority of them fall to the right of that threshold. Vol's interpretation of what was going on is that what was happening in these non-independent ROI analyses 
is they were extracting data from clusters that were already determined to be significant. And then they were running the analysis on those parameters they extracted. So that leads to inflated effect sizes, and I'll show you why that is. Is this background the setup clear enough? Yeah. All right, so this is a typical contrast map. Let's say this is a, a Z statistic map. Each voxel has a Z statistic. We dealt with T statistics. It's, it's basically the same. Now, if we zoom in on a certain you know, subset of voxels here, and let's say this scale represents the range of Z statistics from zero to three, and we give a one tailed test. Let's say, just for the sake of argument, that these are the voxels that contain a true effect, right? Shaded in orange. And let's say that the true effect is actually, uh, you know, the, a beta estimate of 0.3. If I do a, an, a biased ROI analysis, in other words, I threshold this map to only show voxels passing a threshold of 1.65, that's p less than 0.05, it's only going to grab onto voxels that uh, pass that threshold. So in this case, I may be getting some of the true effect voxels, but there are also some noise voxels as well. And the only noise voxels it's going to, to encapsulate are the ones that pass my threshold. So by definition, I'm going to be finding some noise voxels and only going to extract from those that pass that threshold. And it's going to be inflated. Let's say it's about 0.7. Now if I did an, an unbiased ROI analysis, which I'll show you in a little bit, highlighted in blue here, it, it has some of the true effect voxels, it has some of the uh, higher voxels, but it also includes some uh, voxels that are below that threshold as well. It's not defined by the threshold. An unbiased analysis does not care about what uh, the actual data threshold is. Okay. Most important point is to know the difference between the orange and the red. Again, the red includes some true effect voxels, but also some noise voxels. And the noise voxels it includes are going to be uh, leading to an inflated effect size estimate. So a few objections are things like, well, what if I just want to see what's going on in that particular cluster? I found a significant cluster. I didn't have an a priori hypothesis about some kind of ROI I wanted to use. What if you know, I, I tested for an interaction, got this uh, you know, group level map, and I just want to see what's going on to, to see what's driving the interaction? My recommendation is... Uh, you know, you can look at your data, that's totally fine, but I wouldn't publish that effect because the way that we're conditioned to read papers is that they report some kind of effect, um, you know, in, say, a bar chart or something, especially if they include error bars, you're assuming that that's some kind of group inference analysis. And even if you include fine print, I mean, a lot of people skim over that. It's, that's just the way it is. So if you do include it, explain how it was done, be very explicit, but do not include error bars because those will be misleading. Error bars means that's a valid group inference, but if you do a biased ROI analysis, that's not a valid group inference. It's going to be a distortion of what the true effect is. And you may say, well, okay, Maybe that is inflating the effect size or the correlation coefficient, but doesn't the effect actually exist? <clears throat> That's a fair question, and assuming that you did corrections for multiple comparisons like we did yesterday with 3D cluster sim and 3D full path maps, yes, you can say that that cluster does represent a significant effect. But, and this is the important point, magnitude is also important, and it's misleading with a bias analysis. So say you're doing some kind of clinical study. Uh, we know from statistics that if you have enough subjects, at some point you are going to reach statistical, there we go again, statistical significance. I gotta get a speech coach. Statistical significance, I lost my train of thought. Oh, but it can be a uh, trivial or insignificant really uh, effect. Right? It can be so small that it really doesn't make any difference. So magnitude, is also very important. 
So, um, one other thing I want to tie into this, which is also related to the uh, what we were talking about with power analysis before. Um, you know, when we set these thresholds for significance, if you have a really small sample size, again, you're defining your significant effects to be of a certain size. They have to be of a certain size in order to pass that significance threshold. So if you have a sample size of 10, if you find a significant effect, you only find ones that are very, very big. You don't find the small ones. You can't if you're using an alpha level of 0 0.05. This is also called the winner's curse because you may find a significant effect, but most likely it's going to be inflated. And here's why. This is from Button et al. And uh, John Ioannidis, I think is how you pronounce his last name, the, the guy who published why most published research findings are false, except for his, obviously. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, it shows that there's a very steep drop-off when, um, or sorry, the, the bias of uh, how likely it is that this effect size is going to be inflated goes up very, very steeply as the sample size goes down. Okay. To show this from a different angle, uh, this is from Talier Coney's paper. This was his commentary on the Bull study, where he had these curves showing how the power looks if you have effect sizes of different magnitudes. So if we are doing one sample t-test at 0.05, and let's say I have uh, 10 subjects, to get 80% power, I need about 1.2 for my effect size. One, one to 1.2. Those are very, very big effect sizes. And if you're studying a very subtle cognitive effect, it's very unlikely you're going to find something that strong. And it's even worse when you make the alpha level more stringent. So what to do about it? I mean, this is kind of boilerplate stuff, and it's obviously difficult in some cases, but you could increase your sample size. Um, you could use a power analysis beforehand to try to estimate the effect size to get a sense of whether you are seeing uh, something that's a true effect or not. And lastly, pre-registered reports are being touted as a way to combat this problem. And the reason this ties into the replication deal, the replication crisis, is that if people are only reporting really big effect sizes with small samples, and then somebody runs another study with, say, uh, you know, same sample size, um, it may have been that the original study found a true effect, but they're, uh, you know, just by chance, they had found uh, the effect mixed with noise that passed the threshold that they, that they saw, right? Theoretically, you know, if we ran the study a bunch of times, it should tend to zero in on the true effect. But if we're setting a, a lower bound for what that effect can be with our you know, threshold, we're only going to find the bigger ones. So pre-registered reports may mitigate, mitigate that to, to some extent if people are clear about what they're doing beforehand and they're not doing fishing expeditions and only reporting the largest effect sizes. Questions about that so far? This is a somewhat specific question. Yeah. Have you ever been, so you for either behavioral or fMRI data, have you ever been in a situation or know of any resources that can assist in doing a power analysis for a repeated measures of NOVA <coughs> to within a sample size of those? Ooh, I <laughs> don't know. <laughs> that is pretty specific. No one does. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Then I don't feel too bad. Uh, yeah, we should talk about that later. Great. <laughs> yeah, sorry. No, no answer to that. Okay, so let's let's test your judgment. Let's develop some sense of what is a bias analysis. Yeah, you thought you were just going to zone out during this lecture, didn't you? Now we're going to have to think together. Uh, okay, this uh, actually was from a paper. I helped analyze earlier, earlier this year, um, looking at correlations between different measures of uh, gray matter thickness and volume, I believe, and 
some different measures of reading ability. So in one part of this region, we found that it was, you know, there seemed to be a greater correlation. Other one, there was a negative correlation. And a reviewer actually asked me, well, what, just extract the actual data from here, the data from there. Look at the correlation between thickness and volume and those uh, covariates you're using. And I did. And I sent this back in the letter to the editor. But is this a biased analysis? Yeah. Yeah. It's a pretty clear-cut case. And we said, you know, here's what it looks like in case you're curious. Well, we're not going to publish this because, you know, this looks too clean, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if you do this as a bias analysis, you will find nice correlations like this. You know, 0.56, negative 0.47. That's a pretty clean association there. But it's not statistically appropriate. You know, you could do it, obviously, to see, you know, you know what's the direction, what does it seem like the magnitude is like. But if you try to make an inference about the group, that's it's, it's, it's nonsense. Oh, there's my cool fade-in slide. Uh, okay, what about this? Some guy published a paper a couple years ago. And in the methods section, he said, uh, in this approach, second-level analyses are run for each contrast. It's pretty dense. Just try to follow along consecutively leaving out each subject from the GLM and extracting that subject's contrast estimates from the resulting ROI. So run the entire GLM, but leave out one subject, whatever the map looks like, if you find a significant cluster, say in the MPFC, extract that subject, and then consecutively do that for every subject. It's called cross-validation. Is that biased? Everyone's like, yeah. yeah. Now, it's... Technically, it's not. This is is uh, this is a way to use your same data for, let's say, for lack of a better word, you know, training and then testing it, right? So you're building up a model and then you're actually testing what the effect is. Um, just similar to what we'll be doing for MVPA analysis. Okay, a little bit tougher here. I give you a couple freebies. Uh, let's just say that you ran your analysis. And, you know, beforehand you'd pick this ROI in the ACC, you created your, your sphere around it, you said, I'm going to use that for my analysis. And then you actually run your analysis, you get these group level results, and it gets some of it, but it also gets a bunch of stuff that's not part of the effect. And if you average across all of it, you don't get a significant effect. Right? And I say, ooh, actually, I meant to put it up here. <laughs> Okay, and now it's significant. Is that a biased effect? Yes. Okay, what if I divide my elf level by two? Because I'm looking at two ROIs. That's, that's okay, right? Why isn't that okay? Because I'm looking at it? Come on. <laughs> Another big yeah. Right. Yeah. The sad fact is if you already know where your effect is and then you select an ROI afterwards, I, I can't read anybody's mind here. Right? Like, did you decide to use this beforehand or not? There's really no way to check, which is why they think pre registration is you know a way to combat that. But if you run your analysis and you go, oh, I meant to <laughs> put it there, that's, you know, you're really just playing the same game. Did you make a mistake in your script and you put just put that one and it's wrong when you put it there? Good question. And now you're getting into some territory where it's more philosophical than, than anything else. Yeah. Yeah, you made a mistake and then you looked at the group over results and now you know where it is and you go, well, oh, actually, I was going to. Place it somewhere else. It's, it becomes very tricky. So the best I can tell you to do is choose it beforehand and then, you know, come what may, you extract from it. And, you know, nobody says you can't look at your group level analysis at, at some point, you know. People like to know what the whole brain results look like. That's fine. 
but it shouldn't drive where you're going to be doing your ROI analysis. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see in my I'm very convincing in my response on this. So. I just say, come on. Just, come on. Don't be such a party filter. Yeah. I, I didn't even do anything. Oh my God. Uh, okay, so if you want some resources for independent ROIs, everything we did with the Alice, that's that's one approach that you can do. Right. So in other words, uh, these are ROIs that they don't know anything about your data. They're not influenced by your data. What we, what we saw initially was people uh, defining a cluster or ROI based on their results and then extracting from it. And you think about that more and more, logically it just doesn't make sense. It's like we defined it was going to be significant and we tested if it was significant and lo and behold, it's significant. And that's... It makes me feel good when I think about that, but it's not, it's not, uh, it's not right. But if you were to a priori yeah. hypothesis that there were differences in, like, the ACC, yeah. and you did, so you were wanted to do ROI at the end, or something like that, but you did a whole brain analysis anyway to see where there was significant activation in the brain, yeah. if I, and say that there was significant activation within the ACC, mm -hmm. it's not then inappropriate to still do my ROI analysis, is it? Uh, if that is indeed the truth, then yes. it shouldn't be. Okay. But again, but it, it would, what? Sorry, but would it still be inappropriate to define your ROI from your statistical maps? If you define it from your statistical maps, then yeah. 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 So you do stuff something that I like the research, Yeah. Unless you're doing a connectivity analysis, then you can use that functionally defined region of the state. That's true, yeah. Yes. Yeah, there are cases where it may seem like a bias analysis, but it actually isn't. For example, in with, with other kinds of connectivity like PPI, um, because you, you regress out the effect of task from your actual PPI effect. If that went over your head, don't worry about it. I, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole of this PPIs. I don't think P... Okay, now you got me thinking about it. If you're thinking about doing a PPI analysis, you're probably not going to find anything. That's all you should know. <laughs> it's very difficult to find it because you're regressing out yeah. tasks, you're regressing out the time series, and then you're testing for anything above and beyond that. And that's, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I've, I've, there's, whatever, we don't need to repeat that. I've gotten burned before, so... <laughs> Okay, uh, Neurosense, again, very very good tool. We could possibly use this uh, later if we want to for defining an ROI. Um, you know, just try it out on your own. It's pretty intuitive. And you can download the map and then use that as a uh, independent ROI. So as long as you're not using your own statistical maps to draw your ROIs, yeah. then you're... Right, yeah. Okay. Yeah. We just don't want it to be driven by the effect that's already there. Yeah, yeah. or analysis. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this last thing I mentioned cross validation, used in many different contexts. Uh, this is just an animation showing how that works. So we have one, two, three, up to n subjects. You run a group level analysis, but omitting subject number one, you extract the data from subject one from the resulting map. Do that for subject two, subject three, and so on, consecutively through all of your subjects until you do all of them. That's pretty tedious to script. Uh, it can be done, but um, it, it's an option. It's, it's, it's valid, and the reason it is valid is because that subject's data does not contribute to the group map. Yeah. Can I clarify that? I'm kind of having a hard time with my head. Yeah, yeah. So you would do GLM. For everybody but subject one, and get the, uh, yeah. significance in like the ACC, you extract the ACC. Yeah, one. yeah, yeah. And then you would do it for one, everybody except for two, right. and you would maybe get a different area. Yeah, it's going to look slightly different for each mm -hmm. subject. Right, okay. So the idea is you're not going to be systematically grabbing onto uh, 
for that subject, they're not going to be contributing to okay. the effect. Okay. So ultimately, though, when you're doing your ROI analysis, you're going to have... You're going to be doing 26 of them. Okay. In, in, in our case, or whatever it ends. Okay. Got it. Uh, they talk about this in the Esterman, Esterman 2010 paper. And, you know, which cluster that results are you going to extract from, right? Usually it helps if you have a general region where you say, I'm only going to look at this cluster that appears within the MPFC. Okay. okay. In, in my case, in, the, in that paper when I did it, it was pretty clean. I mean, it was a pretty, pretty robust cluster, and it changed from analysis to group analysis, but it was roughly in the same area, so okay. I just kept extracting from it. That makes sense. It, it can get tricky, yeah. for sure, but that becomes something you have to finesse sure. in that case. Kind of analysis helps to identify outliers, or it doesn't happen. Uh, the one I just showed. It's not necessary. It's not really to identify outliers. It's just to you can use the data from your experiment to to run an ROI analysis that's unbiased. It's a data-driven approach. So conclusion: What do we do about it? Choose any one of those independent analysis techniques we talked about. Uh, know the reasons behind choosing it, and also realize that even if you do an independent analysis, that does not always guarantee unbiased results. Because it depends on what you knew and where, where you placed it. Uh, yeah. So let's see here. Do we have time to do this? I think we do. Uh, do people want to do this? Do you want to run a bias analysis? Yeah. It's kind of fun. It's kind of fun because you'll, you'll get some very strong effects. Okay. Uh, have people been logged out? Okay. That's all right. We'll pull this back up. Yeah. Is it your home directory? Okay. Uh, in any case, just navigate to that. Navigate, navigate to your group results. Go into test 01, 3D t-test, and then within there go to test results. Just raise your hand if you're having any problems whatsoever. Yeah. Okay. Moment of truth. We are just type in Apne and open up the graphical user interface from here. All right. So remember, from yesterday, we found out that I believe it was 10 contiguous voxels at 0 0.001 is a significant cluster. Right? Uh, Just said incongruent minus uh, incongruent minus congruent t test is your overlay. It doesn't really matter what the underlay is, so if your M and I template doesn't work, this this will be fine. Um, and then remember to set the voxelwise threshold or cluster defining threshold. Left click in this area right here, near P. Hold it down, go to set P value, and then type in 0 0.001 and hit enter. If you click on clusterize, and for voxels, remember, we determined the threshold was 10. Click on set. We thresholded our map, and anything that remains is a significant cluster. Now, what would happen if we extracted everything from this cluster? So we defined this cluster from our data, and now we're going to extract data from it. To create a mask just with these voxels, this is another useful part of the APNI interface. Click on RPT for report. I'm sorry, Andy, what did you do uh, in clusterize? Oh, clusterize, I set it to 10 voxels, then hit set. Yeah, so that's my thresholded map.
Now, if I go to report, um, we see a bunch of different ones. Uh, let's see here, which one? Okay. Cluster number seven is the one we're going to focus on. Just give one second for this to, to shake out. If you want to save that out as a mask, all you need to do is click on save. Oh, wait, no, whoa, whoa, hold on, hold on. Uh, actually, let me make sure. Oh, write, excuse me, write just this cluster to a data set. Now, you can leave that uh, viewer up. Just notice that in that directory, if you, if you click on write, it's going to output cluster mask 0007. Let me give you a you know a new Apne command that might be useful. 3D rename because cluster 07 doesn't really tell me that much. Give it uh, that cluster name, cluster mask 0007, and let's call that uh, MPFC underscore biased, and press enter. So now if you look, we now have a more meaningful name right here. So useful commands for you reading. OK. So we have our ROI just like we created an ROI before with a sphere or an anatomical atlas. We're going to transfer that to that, uh, was it group stats? L let me make sure I have this right. Stats results. So I think your group results directory is your home directory, right? So what you are going to type is, let's type copy MPFC, hit tab to autocomplete that. I use an asterisk almost all the time just to grab both the head and the brick file because you'll need both of them. And from your directory, it's going to be dot, dot, slash, dot, dot, slash, dot, dot, slash flanker, I believe, slash stats underscore results. That's what you're going to type. So let's make sure you do it, then I'll do it with the paths on my machine. So now navigate to your stats results directory. On your own, uh, I'm going to type some stuff that you don't need to pay attention to. Right, so remember, within our stats results directory, we had incongruent betas, we had congruent betas. So we're going to use those, and we're going to extract them now from this biased MPFC mask. Some reviews, so mask av, and the mask is now going to be MPFC underscore biased. And first, I want you to extract the incongruent betas from that. Oh. And I'm also going to use the quiet flag. Again, you should see 26 numbers. I'm going to put those into my Excel spreadsheet for a comparison with what we did before. Okay, and again, the same thing, but now for congruent betas. Under T, C, S, A, no? Don't worry about Excel. If you can get it to work, that's fine, that's great. But this is just for demonstration purposes. Oh, 
Okay, now does anybody does anybody recall when we previously did this? What was the difference between incongruent congruence? It was like point point one ish. What do you think it's gonna be now if I take the difference between the two? Point four? That's a good guess. It's probably gonna be bigger, right? Yeah. Yeah. Because we've defined it to be a very strong effect for incongruent minus congruent. So it should be bigger than what I did with that uh, you know, anatomical atlas, which had no knowledge of what voxel was significant and which one wasn't. So if I take the average of incongruent, oops, 0.34, average of incongruent, Okay, it's not quite that large, but it's about point, point 0.18. But it's quite a bit bigger than what we found before, which is closer to point 0.1. Clear on how that all works? I'm going to wrap this up with something uh, on my machine. I'm going to go pretty quick. You can follow along if you want, or you can just watch. I recommend uh, just watching, because I'm also going to be asking you a couple questions. So you, you saw how to... You know, create a, a, a mask based on your functional data and then use that as a biased ROI analysis, right? Now here's a question for you to test your understanding of this. If I go back to my group results directory and oh, let me just reset this whole thing. Oops. Go back to this, overlay incongruent minus congruent. But now I'm going to use a more liberal threshold. And let's say I ran, you know, full with half max and everything. And it was something like, you know, 100. Let's just say, for the sake of argument, I, I didn't actually run it. Now, obviously, I'm going to have a cluster that's a little bit bigger. And let me see if that's connected to anything. Ah, that might be a little bit too big. Uh, let me say this is 0 0.01. Just make a little bit. But it's it's less than 0 0.001. Where is that one? Right, okay, so I have a 301 voxel cluster. If I wrote this out, I use it as a, a mask. I did my ROI analysis. Do you think that the resulting incongruent minus congruent contrast I extract from it, would it be a larger difference or a smaller difference from what I just showed you with that 0.001? It smaller? Who says smaller? Who says it's going to be bigger? A couple people. Okay, the, the smaller people. <laughs> Why do you think it's going to be a smaller effect? Smaller person. <laughs> what? Smaller person. That's a good guess. Uh, do people think it's going to be larger? Why? It's a larger <laughs> cluster, maybe? Yeah. Well, okay. Sorry? It's true. It's true. I mean, I was. Yes. Okay. These are all good, good guesses. Let's let's actually test it out. I'll be quick. Don't worry. Ah. Could be. What did I just do? <laughs> oh my god, sorry. Uh, I'm obviously not going to be that quick. OK. 
Okay, so three mask av quiet mask NPFC O one extracting first from incongruent. Moment of truth. <laughs> yeah. uh, oh. Okay, so, yeah, it is, it is a this one. Anybody want to take a guess why? <laughs> more noise about it. What I would say is when we did the 0 .001 threshold, you're only grabbing really, really significant fossils, right? With 0 .05, you're also grabbing ones that are only above the 0.05 level. But the way it's going to average out might pull it down more towards the ones that were, say, just above 0.05 and not the ones. At the that's, this is a weird question, but that's not necessarily true in every case. It isn't. It isn't, yeah. So it, it is. Possibly, yeah. <laughs> it's just with 0 0.001, we're only including really, really strong effects. Uh, yeah. Just wanted you to think about it. Okay. I actually didn't know what it was going to be before I, I did it, so I made up a story. After that. Okay. That's that's everything with that. That's everything with that. Um, any questions before we switch gears to MVPA? Okay. Hope that was informative. <laughs>